Before I begin, I have something to tell you. It was last November, just before Thanksgiving, when Miss Beverly played the song, Bless This House. And the words up on the board were, Bless This Church. After a while, the heads were bowed, eyes closed, and in prayer. Jesus stood there by my row in his white robe. He had the sweetest, nicest smile on his face as if to say, these are my people in whom I am well pleased. I thank God for this vision. And now we go on to the reading. Isaiah 48, 12 through 16. The Lord's call to Israel. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, whom I called. I am he. I am the first. I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I called to them, they stand forth together. Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall perform his purpose on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken and called him. I have brought him, and he will prosper in his way. Draw near to me. Hear this. From the beginning, I have spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lois. We're not going to be looking to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. And in this 28th chapter of Matthew, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 20. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you this Lord's Day and ask that you'd shine within our hearts the pure light of your divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our minds, along with our hearts, that we may understand and embrace the message of Scripture being read and proclaimed this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, titled, The Great Commission. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. According to our church calendar, this is what we call Trinity Sunday, the Sunday after Pentecost, a day of which the Christian church historically has celebrated one of the central beliefs, the idea of the triune God. God in three persons, blessed Trinity, as was stated in the first hymn that we sang this morning, a hymn of which Pastor John acknowledged that many Presbyterians say that they love to sing more than any other. Well, you may have heard the story about a little girl during Sunday school as she was drawing with crayons. Her teacher asked her what she was drawing. I am drawing a picture of God, the little girl responded. But nobody knows what God looks like, the teacher said. To which then the little girl replied, well, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> there is some sense in what that little girl was doing. To draw a picture of God, to know what God looks like, to know what God is all about, is what one hopes and what one expects is behind of what this place we call 
the church. It is what is one of our most confusing doctrines is all about. The doctrine of the Trinity. Now the Bible teaches us that God lives in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person is equal in stature to the other. But let's be honest. It is hard for us to wrap our little brains around the Trinity. And the truth is, the Trinity is a great mystery that is hard for anyone to understand, and even harder for anyone to explain. But yet, it lies at the foundation of what we, as Christians, believe about God. Almost every one of the creeds within our church affirms our belief in God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now in Scripture, we have heard about the three persons of the Trinity. We have recalled how God has been revealed to us in three distinct ways. Within the first chapter of Genesis, it recounts the power of God, the Creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A loving and powerful God made the universe in all of its vastness and mystery. And then in the eighth psalm, it sings of the wonders of this universe and how they reveal to us the power of our Creator. The stars, the planets, the oceans, and the mountains. All of it came from the hand of God. But this Creator, God, is not just concerned with the grandness of the universe. God also created each strand of our DNA with very much care. God created each one of us to be very unique, to have special gifts and special purpose. Your life and my life matters to God. And we have a place in this universe and we also have a calling to fulfill. It is God who has created us in love. And it is God who calls us to live in that same love. So yes, that all makes perfect sense to us. That's relevant to our daily lives. One way that God teaches us how to love creation and one another is within the person of Jesus Christ. As Matthew and the other gospel writers tells us, Jesus, he walked right alongside with us, right upon the face of this earth, to show us the face of God. And in Jesus' death and his resurrection, God becomes our Redeemer. Now we spend a lot of time within our church talking about Jesus. And we learn about Jesus' teaching and about his example and his healing and about his love. And those gospel stories give us something tangible for us to hold on to. Jesus gives us all sorts of guidance on how that we are to live our lives. And it is not hard for us to find ways that Jesus is relevant to our lives. Christ claimed to answer all of those deep questions about our existence. Now, at one time or another, we all question about what life is all about. Have you ever gazed up at the stars on that really pitch dark black evening and wondered who put them there? Or have you ever seen a sunset and thought about life's biggest questions? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going to go after I die? And although many philosophers, along with religious leaders, have offered their answers to the meaning of life, only Jesus the Christ proved his credentials by rising from the dead. And now, what about the Holy Spirit? For many of us, the Spirit is very relevant to our daily living. We recognize the Spirit's activity all around us 
And those little nudges to call someone or to possibly text someone or possibly to pray for someone. And the peace That surrounds us when we're undergoing surgery. The feeling that one gets when they're knitting or crocheting a prayer shawl. That inspiration that comes when we're teaching Sunday school or possibly leading a small group. A devotion during one of those women's groups or those men's groups that really touches us. Or during the gathering of our grief share program that takes place here or in the time of praying and one of our community meetings where truth is spoken and consensus is reached. Many of us know the Spirit as our sustainer. Know the Spirit as our inspirator. Knows the Spirit as our daily guide. So yes, we see daily evidence of God our Creator. We strive to follow the concrete example of Jesus the Christ. And we look for signs for the Holy Spirit around us. Individually, the three persons of the Trinity make sense to us. But what does it mean for the three to be one? The one to be three. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One and three in one. What power can this mysterious doctrine have to us? Well, there's something beautiful and very powerful about a God in three persons. And there is something God can reveal to us when we ponder this mystery of the Trinity. During my seminary studies, I had to study art. Now, I have to admit to you this morning that this is an area that I am not gifted in whatsoever nor do I know much about. I was introduced during that time of study to religious icons. Now, an icon is not a painting in the sense that we normally regard pieces of art, although it is an image that is painted. Icons are religious images that hover between two worlds, putting into colors and shapes what cannot be grasped easily by our intellect. What they do is they render the invisible visible. So icons are the visible equivalents of the divine scriptures, religious pictures that convey inner spiritual meaning of their subjected matter. Now in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, there's an icon of the Holy Trinity painted by Andrei Rulib, sometimes around the year of 1412 to 1410. And now you can see that on the screen. Now in Andrew Lublev's icon, the persons of the Holy Trinity are shown in order in which they are confessed. The very first figure is the first person of the Trinity, God the Father. The second, the middle figure, is God the Son. And the third figure is God the Holy Spirit. Now all three figures have staffs within their hands as a symbol of their divine power. Now the very first figure, shown on the left, is vested in a blue undergarment which depicts his divine celestial nature. Along with a light purple outer garment, which attests to the unfathomable nature and the royal dignity of this figure. Behind him, along with being above him, is a tower of a house. Well, this image of the abode has a symbolic meaning. You see, that house signifies God's master plan for his creation. While the fact that the house towers above the first figure shows him to be the head or the father of this creation. The same fatherly authority is seen in his entire appearance. His head is not bowed, and he is looking at the other two figures. His whole entire demeanor, the expression on his face, the placement of his hands, and the way that he is sitting, all speaks 
of his fatherly dignity. Now the other two figures have their heads inclined and their eyes turned toward that very first figure with great attention, as though conversing with him about the salvation of all mankind. The second figure is placed right in the middle of this icon. Now this placement is determined by the position held by the second person within the Trinity itself. Above his head extends the branches of an oak tree. The vestments of the second figure correspond to those which the Savior is usually depicted. The undergarment is a dark crimson color which symbolizes the incarnation. While the white-blue outer robe signifies the divinity and the celestial nature of this figure. The second figure is inclined toward the first figure as though in deep conversation. The tree behind him serves for us as a reminder of the tree of life that was standing within the Garden of Eden and, of course, of the cross itself. Now, the third figure on the right is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. His light blue undergarment and smoky green outer garment represent heaven along with earth and signify the life-giving force of the Holy Spirit, which animates everything that exists. By the Holy Spirit, every soul lives and is elevated in purity. And this elevation in purity is represented in this icon by a mountain above that third figure. On the table is a chalice. Now what this image reveals, I believe, is that in God there is a living, loving community. From the beginning of time, from the beginning of creation until the end of the age. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have existed as a holy community of love and of grace. To put it another way, God is community. So as we reflect on the Trinity, let's not let it be just a vague and dry doctrine to us. Let's not write it off as something that's just too complicated for us to understand. Let's not leave it to all those experts and seminary professors to debate about. Let's think about the community of love that has been within God since the beginning of time. And let's accept God's invitation to join him within that community. As we see real, concrete examples of how God has created us, redeemed us, and sustained us, let us too respond in love and gratitude. And as we join to celebrate this Holy Communion this day, let's also add our love to the Trinity's communion of love. What's more, let's let God be revealed in our community. Because the Trinity teaches us that no one stands alone. And as soon as we accept God's love and redemption, we become members within that community. And we cannot, as Christians, without being connected to one another, survive. If we are going to embrace God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Sustainer, then we're going to have to embrace one another. Not just the folks who are inside this church's four walls this morning, but with everyone who calls upon the triune God. And if that wasn't hard enough, God also calls us to do more. Not only do we have to love other believers, but we have to go out into the world and share God's love with the world. In our passage that Lois shared with us from Isaiah, we saw that in spite of all of their failures, God reminded Jacob and the nation Israel that he called them and chose them to be his people. He created the heavens and the earth and has dominion over them. 
And he will protect them from Babylon and the Chaldeans. Well, just as God's message of love to his people was one of encouragement to Israel in the Old Testament, so it is a promise along with a blessing to the New Testament church as well. Because you see, because of all of us being sinners, we deserve the wrath of God against our sins. And yet, he sent his only begotten son to come to this earth and to die as a sacrifice for our sins. And when he ascended back into heaven, that was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost, the pastor John preached and shared a message to us last week. The love that we find in the Trinity, the communion we find with one another, is not just for our own sake, no. It is for the sake for the entire world. And it is meant to be shared. Now Jesus commands his followers, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The world needs love. The world needs grace. The world needs community. The world needs to hear the good news, the gospel of Jesus the Christ. May the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, help us to share this gospel message of salvation with all of creation. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we thank you for creating us. We thank you for redeeming us through your only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. And thank you for indwelling us with the Holy Spirit. Help us to go out into our community, out into the world, sharing this message and to love as you have loved us. Amen.